difference between this and my kids riding my kids all day. I got one next to me online with her teacher. The other one is supposed to be reading his social studies. Which one's I see mommy? Oh my god. Tell them tell them that if uh, if mommy completes Bailey. this, uh, this hey. lab, then then Professor Britton's gonna give her an alien car. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I saw that in the chat log and I died. I died. That Bailey. Hey. He came and whispered it in my ear too, because he think he thought you could you hear this? him. Do you want this? <laughs> like there's nothing in my hand, silly. Like that's <laughs> yeah, that ain't fair. You gotta you gotta give him the treat, you know? She figured that she figured she figured out there was nothing in my hand and she looked back down again. Let me see what what's in my phone here. Yeah, she's smart. Oh, my lizard won't let me hold her half the time. I'll have to, um, yeah. I'll have to, like, she'll only do it when she wants me to. Like, she'll, I'll know because she'll kind of, like, uh, like, try to, like, crawl up the glass, I guess. Uh -huh. She'll be, like, wa like roaming around, and then when I put my hand in there, she just roams onto my hand, and I just hold her. But uh, if she's laying down, I put my hand near her, she licks me, and she's like, go away. I don't want to. <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll share. I have a, a new raccoon video if you guys want to see at the end. But let's do our let's do our homework because I'm recording now, and I'm sure that people at uh, watching later on will want to get to biz. Uh, does everyone feel pretty ready to go? Want to crank this one out? It won't take too long today, okay? Uh, yes. Let me go to speaker view uh, and let let me click on myself. Okay, summon the raccoon. Yes. <laughs> Um, we're doing uh, uh, homework. Which number is this again? Is this homework six? Yeah, I think that's... it's. I'm pretty sure it's homework six, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, do you guys have the syllabus, or I can read the problems if you have the numbers? Chapter five. <laughs> This is the first one. Shouldn't have sold my book back. <laughs> I got one here for us. Chapter five, what? 56. 56, all right. So I'm going to page uh, 163, sorry, 164. Question 56 is about an X-ray photon. What is the wavelength of an X-ray photon with an energy of 10 kilo electron volts? What is its frequency? So we have an X-ray photon. They've given us an energy of 10 kilo electron volts. They want us to find the wavelength and the frequency. This should be a very easy problem. What are the formulas that I want to use for this class? Is it E equals H times F? Uh, that's one of them. What's the other form? That's to get the frequency. What about to get the wavelength? Wavelength equals frequency times speed of light? That doesn't sound right to me. I want one in terms of energy. Wavelength does not equal frequency times speed of light. Speed of light equals frequency times wavelength. And we could use that one, I guess. I was thinking that we would use Planck's constant times the speed of light over the wavelength. These two formulas relate the energy of the photon, which we have, to both the frequency and the wavelength. Now, Tina, we could use this one as well, but there's a couple of different ways to complete this circuit, you know? Are electron volts MKS units for energy? Can I plug electron volts? Can I plug kilo electron volts into these equations? Be joules? Yeah, we need to convert to joules. So let's do that. So we have 10 kilo electron volts, and we've got to convert them from KeV to EV. What's my conversion factor? 
1,000 at the top and one at the bottom. Excellent. Tina knows and loves the metric system. That takes care of the KEV. How about to go from EV to joules? Should it be 1.60 times 10 to the neg negative 19 joules over one EV? That sounds very good to me, Tina. All right, let's punch them up. Actually, students, come on. We don't even need a calculator because we have brains. We have a very good brain, just like Donald Trump, okay? How many zeros is this? 10 times 1,000. How many zeros does that give us? Four. Okay, so add four to negative 19, and what do you get? Negative 15. Yeah. So the energy then is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 15 joules. Okay. Let's start with this equation here. I'm going to rearrange it to solve for wavelength. Wavelength is Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the energy. I basically flipped the wavelength up and the energy down. <clears throat> Planck's constant is kind of like 7 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. Let me do my units in blue here. The speed of light, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And the energy is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 15 joules. Go ahead and plug that in class. Well, no. geez, guys, I'm going to grow old and die waiting for the answer. Is it 1.3 oh, wow. times 10 to the negative 10 times? What are my units? Meters. Anyone know what that would be in angstroms? Do you guys remember what an angstrom is from a previous lecture? It's one tenth away. I just can't remember if it's up or down. Um, an angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. It's a 10 billionth of a meter. So how many angstroms is that? Just be 1.3. Yeah. All right. Now let's get the frequency. The frequency is going to be E divided by Planck's constant. So it's uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 15 joules. over seven times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. What you got? Two point three times 10 to the 18th. Units? Um, seconds. False. Per second. Over seconds. Per second. Oh, per right? Second. Or cycles per second, which is 2.3 times 10 to the 18 hertz. 
Ja? Yes. Box it up and ship it home. We are done. One out of five down. What page are we on in the book? Uh, Jace, can you say that again? What page are we on in the book? Um, 164 by my text. Thanks. That was a victory sip right there. I'm just giving everyone uh, at home a moment to get all this down before I erase it all. Box the right one. Sure. Oh. It looks focused for me, Jillian. Is it not focused for you? Or Jillian, uh, tell me how to help. I want to help. You boxed. No, I boxed frequency, Jillian. Oh, uh, oh, I see. Yes. Okay, fine. I box the energy. You're right. You're right, Jillian. I'm sorry. Box one, one point three angstroms. But the that was one of the boxes we had to work on. So whatever. We did a unit conversion. That's worth one point, and these are each worth two points. You can't make a uh, horn. Wait, no, Jillian, are you in speaker mode or are you in gallery mode? If you're in gallery mode, the box is, my box is going to be small. But if at the top you click speaker mode, you can make me nice and big, and then you should be able to read everything. Is that what's going on? Kayla, you can read this, right? I can. I think that your screen focus shifts, like, it's more blurry towards the bottom. Maybe try tilting. Um... Bloody hell. <clears throat> Let's try this. Is that better, Jillian? I can't see what you're typing, but. That's really clear. Yeah, the iPhone CCD is much better. Man, I, I don't even want to tell you guys what I paid for this stupid effing camera. And now it's not even like, maybe I've got a, I thought I clicked high definition. It's very irritating because it doesn't give you as much. Oh, I can touch up my appearance. Let's touch up my appearance. Oh, yeah. Looks so much more beautiful now. Maybe that touches up the screen appearance too. I don't know. It does look blurry at the bottom, doesn't it? I'll try to write only at the top. Can I erase now? Jillian, are you cool? I got to find your little face and see what's going on there. Oh, thumbs up, Jillian, right? Okay. Uh, Peyton, how about you? Are you done, buddy? Okay, let's move on. Next problem is 58, right? Thank you. Thank you, Chase. Oh, we got an autofocus issue here. Fucking irritating. Okay. Um, let's see. 58. What does it say? Thermal radiation laws. A. Find the emitted power per square meter. Who the hell talks like this anyways? Who, who, who would dare say find the emitted power per square meter? Students, do you understand what they're asking you for there? What is power again? 
How do we define power? Energy over distance. Not energy over distance, but energy over time. Time. So what are they asking us for then if they want the power per square meter? What the hell does that mean? Are they looking for brightness? That's right. Very good. That's what a normal person would call it. And a str you know, who is this guy anyways? Power per square meter. Find the brightness. That's what they should have said. Uh, and the wavelength of peak intensity and find lambda max for a, uh, where am I here? For a black body at 3000 Kelvin. That sounds familiar. All right, what formulas do I want, class? What did we learn? <clears throat> Is it law one? What's that first law? What do we call uh, that? Thing? Is it alpha? What is that symbol that looks like a, a zero with a little cube thing on top? Oh. Is that times t to the fourth? Oh, oh, that, that's the Greek letter sigma. That's the Stefan-Boltzmann constant. It's, it's the Stefan-Boltzmann law. Brightness is sigma t to the fourth. That, that Greek letter is called sigma. And the sigma here is the Stefan-Boltzmann constant. It's six times 10 to the minus eight watts per meter squared per Kelvin to the fourth. Okay, Tina, you got the right idea. So let's plug in our values here. The brightness is six times 10 to the minus eight. The units are watts per meter squared per Kelvin to the fourth times 3,000 Kelvin. You guys remember how to do that fourth power thing on your calculators? Yes. All right. Well, then punch them up. I got 4.9 million watts per square meter. Excellent, Tina. That sounds right to me. I don't remember how to do that thing on the calculator. I'll show you. Thank you. Here we go. So we'll do 6 EXP minus 8 times 3,000. Now here's the magic button. It's our x to the power of y key. How close can I get here? Man, this dumb CCD. Whatever jerk off invented, <laughs> programmed this thing for autofocus, he, should, he or she should die. That's how I feel. <laughs> that person should die. To the power of four equals. Did that help? But yeah, that helps. Yeah. Thank you. With, with the virus going around, they just might. <laughs> yeah, I know. I guess I shouldn't talk, make jokes. Like <laughs> All right. <laughs> Box it up. That's a classy move. All right, we ready to move on to part B class? Yeah. Oh, Caleb, give me a second. All set. Okay. Lucas, you okay with me erasing? Everyone else? All right. Um, I wanted to keep up top because it seems to be better focus up there. So for question B, they say to find the brightness and the wave. Oh, shoot. 
Wait a minute, guys. We forgot to buy the peak wavelength in part A. Nuts. Right? For a temperature of 3,000 Kelvin, our lambda max is 3 million nanometers times Kelvins, all divided by 3,000 Kelvin. What do you get? One thousand nanometers. What regime of the electromagnetic spectrum is that found? Infrared. That's very good. Can you tell me how many microns that is? How many microns, metric lovers? One point zero. That's right. That's one micron. So we already kind of knew that because a 3,000 Kelvin black body is like the temperature of a, a tungsten filament, right? Also roughly the temperature of the surface of the star Betelgeuse. Okay. I'm gonna erase. Going once, going twice. All right, let's try B. In B, we have to find the same things, the brightness and the peak wavelength for a black body whose temperature is 50,000 Kelvin. Ooh, that's hot. Second verse, same as the first. We're going to go ahead and we're going to find our brightness. It's 6 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared per Kelvin to the fourth times 50,000 Kelvin to the power of four. <clears throat> 375 billion watts per square meter. Holy smokes. Seven billion. Did anyone else get that? Can I just get a confirmation from someone else? I got 375. Oh, 375 billion. Is, if it's right. That seems to be what Kayla got too. She got 3.75 times into the 11, which is 37. Oh, I see. I think your microphone must have clipped out. Let's try that again. All right. And how about the lambda max, the peak wavelength? Sixty nanometers. What regime of the electromagnetic spectrum? Ultraviolet. Excellent. Man, you guys are starting to really know your EM spectrum. I'm very pleased with you. Okay, this problem's done. We're two-fifths of the way through it. And two-fifths is 40%. I'm still writing stuff down. Give me a second. Sure thing. What does it say under the 60 nanometers? Oh, UV. Oh. Just like ultraviolet. On my screen, I see everything backwards, so it's a little goofy. Maybe I should flip my screen. I bet I could do that. And then I could see better what you're seeing. Uh, advanced. Oh. Okay, I'm good. Video rendering post process. Disable video capturing. 
Oh, I wonder if this would let me direct flip mode. Hardware processing. You guys can't see what I'm doing here, but uh, whatever. Okay. Can I, uh, I'm sorry, can I erase students? Yeah, I'm doing it. Hey, Jace, are, are, would you be down to read the next problem for me? Do you have a book? Yeah, sure. What's the number? <clears throat> 59, hold on one second. Don't forget to read me the title because you know I like the title too. Hotter Sun. Ready? Wait, is this really the problem? 59, yeah. Is that right? Chapter five? Did I ask question number 60? Uh, no, that's not listed in the homework. That's crazy though, because 60 would be like the better. All right, you know what? Fine, who cares? Let's just do it. Um, I was going to change the number spontaneously, but with some of our people watching later, that could lead to hideous confusion. I don't know why I chose this one, but let's go ahead and do it. The surface temperature of the sun or suppose the surface temperature of the sun were about 12,000 Kelvin rather than 600 Kelvin. A, 600 how or much? 6,000. 6,000, sorry. How much more thermal radiation would the sun emit? That's A. Okay, what formula tells us the quantity of information? Sorry, what, what formula tells us the quantity of radiation that a black body puts out? What formula measures the, the amount of light? I just want to know if you guys can relate to this. Inverse square law? Not the inverse square. Well, the inverse square law also computes brightness, but it computes brightness based on luminosity and radius. You don't know what the luminosity of this newer, hotter sun is, although one could compute it. But any way you're going to cut it, you're going to need what law? Alpha T squared? Oh, sigma, well, alpha T Same. squared. It's not squared though, Tina, is it? Sorry, it's to the fourth. That's right. Now, I'm gonna show you guys something tricky here. The brightness of my black body is the stefan boltzmann constant times T to the fourth. And if we wanted to be robots and brute mechanics, we could plug in the two temperatures, get two brightnesses, and then we could compare them by dividing. But what if we were smart and we did this algebraically first? Hear me out on this. I'm gonna calculate the brightness of a 12,000 Kelvin black body, and I wanna divide it by the brightness of a 6,000 Kelvin black body. What if instead of doing it with numbers, I did it with algebra? Then I would have sigma times a temperature of 12,000 Kelvin to the fourth power over sigma times the temperature of 6,000 Kelvin to the fourth power. Now, you can't help but notice that the Stefan Boltzmann constants cancel out. And if I was a real slick, tricky Ricky, I could even factor out the fourth power from my temperatures. And I could get the ratio of the temperature at 12,000 Kelvin to the ratio of the temperature at 6,000 Kelvin raised to the fourth power. Now class, how many times greater 
is 12,000 versus 6,000. Twice as large. Twice as much, meaning it's two to the power of four or what? Eight. 16, sorry. 16, what are my units? What are my units? Did I just lose you all? Did I just like? Lots over meter squared? No. Kelvin? Nope. Got to figure it out. What just happened there? Figure it out while you look at my diffraction pattern. By the way, this is a two-dimensional diffraction pattern from my laser. And since I've clearly bamboozled you like deers and headlights, I'm going to continue to bamboozle you with the tricky light show, OK? <laughs> what the hell did I just do? I just did some whack algebra there, and I totally lost you guys. Would it be the watts, per, watts over meter squared? No, uh, Samantha, because I, I would agree with you that the units of brightness are watts per square meter. But here, I took a ratio of brightnesses. Did I not? Sorry? There are no units. Thank you, someone who understands me. What, what does it mean then? What is the meaning of 16? 16 times more, 16 more thermal radiation, something like that. Thank you. Who's talking right now? Marcos. Marcos, you are awesome. I can't see your face. But I know you're there now, and I know that you are awesome, OK? 16 times more radiation, or 16 times more light. If the sun was twice as hot, it would give off 16 times more light. Let's see what would happen to its peak wavelength of observation. That's question B. For this one, we're not going to do it algebraically. We're going to plug in the numbers. Um, I'm just going to give everyone a moment to write all this down. Okay, I want to move on. Cocktail hour is rapidly approaching in the Britain household. <laughs> okay, I'm going to erase. Okay, let's try B this way. Question B, uh, Jace, said something like, what would happen to the sun's peak wavelength of emission? Uh, today, the peak wavelength of emission can be found by Wien's law. And as Jillian correctly helped me realize last time, it's Wien IE, not Wien EI, which means wine. Okay? So Wien's law tells us that lambda max today is 3 million nanometer kelvins divided by 6,000 kelvins. What is the sun's peak wavelength of emission today? Five hundred nanometers. Excellent, Laura. Very good. And Laura, do you know whereabouts on the electromagnetic spectrum? 500 nanometers is located? Is that like blue, green? Yeah, it's, it's actually teal or green. And I will prove that to you with a quick share screen.
I will leave YouTube behind. I will go to my visible continuous spectrum. This is slide 19. 500 is somewhere between teal and green. Okay, what if instead the sun had doubled its temperature to 12,000 Kelvin? You know, there are many stars in the nighttime sky that have temperatures of 12,000 Kelvin. One star is Sirius, the brightest star in our sky. It's very close to that. So um, in that case, the peak wavelength of emission of our star would be 3 million nanometer Kelvins over 12,000 Kelvin. What does that give us? 250 nanometers. And notice that because wavelength of peak emission is inversely proportional to temperature, a doubling of the temperature drops the wavelength by half. I have 2,500 nanometers. That, uh, that can't be right because that would put us in the infrared like it was a 3,000 Kelvin black body or something. So Jace, something went wrong there. Can you plug it in one more time for me? Do you agree with me now, Jace, or the class now? Yeah. All right, keep us on our toes though, buddy. It wouldn't be the first time someone made a mistake in this class. Okay, and this is in what part of the spectrum? Laura, do you know? Um, no, I mean, is it in the, no, I don't know. <laughs> is it in the visible spectrum? No. Is it shorter or longer? Shorter. So, guess. The, uh, my brain is blinking, but like the. Um, what's, what's shorter than violet? Ultraviolet? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, question C is very interesting. Question C is the whole point to this problem. And it's kind of about finding aliens around other stars. Question C says, do you think it would be possible for life to still exist on Earth under these conditions? Let's talk about that. Can life develop around a 15,000 Kelvin star? Wouldn't it depend on how far away the planet is? Okay, fine. I guess you got a point, but Earth probably wouldn't be okay because not only would you have 16 times more radiation from the sun, which is a crap load more, but your also peak wavelength would be an ultraviolet, which can sizzle apart and cook the cells in any kind of biological organism. You know, even around our own sun at 1AU, life had to develop on oceans before the land because until life had kind of created this oxygen barrier in the form of an ozone layer, which is effectively like an ultraviolet shield, before the ozone layer developed on Earth, the ultraviolet flux on land was too powerful for any cellular life to exist. Just think about the sunburn that you get at the beach in the summertime and realize that that UV flux has been greatly diminished by the ozone in our stratosphere. If you took all that away, you wouldn't just get a sunburn, you would literally break down the cellular components in your body and you would not be able to live. Now, if you had 16 times the radiation of the sun peaking at 250 nanometers, egads, that would not be a fun place to live. So the quick answer to the question is no. The flux of light would be too intense and with a peak in the ultraviolet, um, only very 
extreme forms of life could survive. Now, look students, I wouldn't go as far as saying no life could survive, but of course, as some of you fans know, um, NASA did some experiments on these creepy little crawlers called tardigrades or water bears. And tardigrades are these microscopic organisms. Sorry? No, I, I love these guys. Yeah, tardigrades. Well, I'm spelling them wrong, right? Yeah, you are. Okay, help me. Is it tetra? Tetra? A R D E. Oh, thank you. Uh, tard tard D I. Sorry. There you go. Look at this little thing. This is like something out of your nightmares, right? Now, these are some of the hardiest organisms on Earth. These tardigrades. They're a little less than a micron across, or something. I think they're about a, maybe a couple microns. I can't remember. Anyways, they took these things into outer space and they put them into the vacuum of space where they had no water, no air, and they were exposed to the pure ultraviolet flux of sunlight. And they kind of dried out, and then they brought them back onto the space station or whatever, and then they discovered that they could be rehydrated and brought right back to life. These little buggers could take a, hitch a ride on a, a meteoroid and fly to another planet through the depths of space probably. So there's some crazy forms of life out there that can survive in some very harsh conditions. We're kind of wimpy as humans. We can't handle that outer space environment, but these little buggers can. Anyways, you can learn more about tardigrades on Wikipedia. I was wondering if, what size they are. Oh. The biggest can be 1.5 millimeters. Holy cow. Okay, so I thought they were micron scale. Newly hatched ones are 50 microns. So a little bigger than I originally imagined. Wow, that's totally cool. You can see one millimeter with the naked eye. Huh. Anyways. Okay. Enough fun there, folks. We got two more problems left to go. Can I erase? Can you? Uh, just one second. Yep. Can you reread that bottom? Because I can't read what it says. Yeah, I did bad. Let me let me reread it and share it on my phone at the same time. Thank and you. And that's for anyone uh, later on. No, the flux of light would be too intense. Sorry, I wrote intense really badly here. The flux of light would be too intense, comma. And with a peak, I should have said peak wavelength. And with a peak wavelength in the ultraviolet, only very extreme forms of life could survive. When I write quickly, my handwriting is not great. Did that help? Yeah, that helped a lot. Thank you. Sure. All right, in that case, I'd like to erase. We're good. All right. Jace, can you get, the next problems are from chapter six. Yep, I got them. Uh, where's my damned eraser? Here we go. All right. All right. This next problem is from chapter six. What's the number? 52. The title? 
finding planet. Hold on, I got a fucking focus issue here. I think if I get close, and then I slowly pull away. There we go. Um, finding planets. Okay, go for it. Suppose you are looking at our own solar system from a distance of 10 light years. A, what angular resolution would you need to see the sun and Jupiter as distinct points of light? Okay, let's try to draw a picture here. I'm sorry, my, my autofocus is going ballistic here. Okay, so let's start with ourselves on Earth here by drawing an eyeball. And then over here, we're going to have the sun. And we're going to have the planet Jupiter. Is that what I think it is? Separated by some angle there. Go ahead and draw that picture. Oh man, they're feeding the raccoon. Okay, you guys want to see this? Definitely. <laughs> yes, enjoy. Open up. Yeah. I can see his little nose. He legit lives in the sewer. <laughs> Just uh, just another day downtown, folks. No big deal. <laughs> Did you guys get to see him for a second? He kind of popped, popped back in. Hey, how far away is Jupiter from the sun? Five AU. Very good, Jace. Um, and here's 10 light years. We need to know what angular resolution we would require to resolve the sun and Jupiter as distinct points of light, right? The angular resolution is some angle alpha. And if we were looking at this, at this on our CCD camera, We'd want to be able to see the star and we'd want to be able to see the planet as two distinct points on our image viewer, just like you can see here. This sounds like a job for what formula from today's lecture? Small angle. Solve for uh, angle, right? Yeah. Alpha is 206.265 arc seconds times S divided by D. Now, I know from long experience solving this problem that all we really need is for S and D to be in the same units. And it's going to be really convenient for us to convert the 10 light years to AUs rather than convert both to kilometers. So let's take our 10 light years. Anyone remember what the conversion factor is to go from light years? Two kilometers. Is it nine point one? Yeah. You go, Tina. All right. So is it um nine point five times ten to the twelve? 
Excellent. Over one light year. 9.5 trillion. And then now we got to go from kilometers to AU. I won't make the mistake that I made before that Jace busted me on. One AU is 150 kilometers. Cross out light years, cross out kilometers. 10 light years is how many AU? Two sig figs will do it for me. I'll check on the raccoon while you guys punch. Shout it out when you get an answer. Six million? No, that's too great. Count the zeros again, Jace. Six hundred thousand. Was that two sig, it? two sig figs? Six hundred thirty thousand. Thank you. That's a good number to remember because then you can remember that one one light year is sixty three thousand AU. Good number to know. Okay, let's plug it into our small angle formula now. Alpha is equal to 206.265 arc seconds times uh, 5 AU over 630,000 AU. Punch that up, kids. Man, everybody's feeding that damn raccoon. He's going to get so fat. Is it 1.6 arc seconds? Excellent. Yes, it is. Box that. OK, Jace, go ahead and read part B when you're ready. What angular resolution would you need to see the sun and earth as distinct points of light? Okay. On the same diagram, I'm now going to put earth as a, a pale blue dot, as uh, Carl Sagan would call it. And we're going to just have a smaller angle between the sun and earth. This question, of course, is asking, suppose we were looking at a star that was 10 light years away like Sirius, would I be able to resolve planets with a reasonable sized telescope? Okay, our 10 light years is still equal to 630,000. All we really need to do is rewrite this equation. And by the way, uh, please students, you know I care about formatting. So let's start off by writing part B. But all we're gonna do is we're gonna rewrite this equation again substituting in 1 AU instead of 5 AU, because the Earth is 1 AU from the sun. So go ahead and punch that one up for me. Or divide your last answer by 5 and get the same thing. 0 0.3 nanometers. Whoa, nanometers? Uh, arc seconds. Sure. Man, that reminds me of something else that was 0 0.3 arc seconds today. Resolution okay. of the CCRI telescope? Yeah, Jace, this seems to suggest that if I put the CCRI 16-inch telescope on the moon, I could resolve a planet 10 light years away. Doesn't that sound effing nuts? Yeah. Okay, what's part C ask us? How do the angular resolutions you found in parts A and B compare to the angular resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope? Comment on the challenge of making Im images of planets around other stars. 
Okay. So um, let's go ahead. Jace, you have a very nice timbre to your voice. You could be a wonderful radio DJ. So I want to thank you. you. <laughs> um, I'm going to erase this and we're going to uh, solve part C together here. So it tells us in the textbook that the Hubble Space Telescope, which is probably uh, the world's best telescope to date because it's the only optical telescope that sits above the atmosphere of Earth, it has an angular resolution of 0 0.05 arc seconds. Astronomers might call that 50 milli arc seconds if they move the decimal place three po uh, points. Um, and that means that, in theory, Hubble should be easily able to resolve planets 10 light years away as 0 0.05 arc seconds is much less than either 1.6 arc seconds or even 0.3 arc seconds. So we should be able to resolve an Earth distance planet or even a Jupiter distance planet with the Hubble Space Telescope. So why don't I have any pictures of planets on the internet? Why don't I actually get to do this? It turns out it's not an angular resolution issue, like I suggested at the beginning of this course. Not that you'd know the answer, but I thought maybe you could try to guess. The atmosphere, right? No, Hubble's outside the atmosphere. It doesn't have that problem. Oh yeah. Imagine taking a picture on a CCD camera and having a really bright star like Sirius and then a planet like Jupiter somewhere nearby. Planets don't shine by emitted light, but they shine by reflected light from the star nearby. This star is so many times brighter than the planet that in the image, the exposure of the star would completely outshine the planet and the planet would get lost in the brightness or the glare it's a, of the star. It's a contrast issue, you see? This thing might pump out a million times more light than is reflected from the planet. And so if you take an exposure of two seconds or three seconds on your camera, you'll totally blow out the camera and the star will get lost sort of in the background glare. So we can finish up by saying, in practice, the light from the planet is so much dimmer than the star that the planet would be lost in the glare from the much brighter star. All right, I did not write that neatly. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through the numbers in that again. In practice, the light from the planet is so much dimmer than the star that the planet would be lost in the glare from the much brighter star.
We have one problem left and then we're done. I'm ready to erase. Uh, I'm still copying. Was that Matthew? Just let me know when you're done, Matthew. Yeah, okay. You good? Uh, Professor not Britton? Yet, no. Yes. Is that the same thing as diffraction? Uh, the, the glare that the plant is emitting? Um, believe it or not, the answer to that question is yes. But because diffraction is a very complicated subject, I really only had time to sort of just loosely acquaint you with it. Um, but I, it is something that I wanted to talk about, so I'm just going to spend two seconds showing you a very, very fast picture. In theory, Tina, a planet, I'm sorry, a star is so far away that if they're unresolved as point sources, the light from a star is literally a mathematical point of light. I want to show you, um, what's it called? Uh, it's a diffraction pattern. And, and the light from a star not only creates uh, this power pattern, it also creates something called an airy disk. It's a Bessel function. That's what I was looking for, a Bessel function. But in any case, let me just show you this and see if you can follow my logic here. Can you see my Wikipedia page here? Uh, Tina, can you see my page? Sorry, I didn't yes. I lost. Okay, yes. cool. Um, if you shine laser light through a tiny pinhole, some of the laser light turns into this circular diffraction pattern, but I want you to focus on that little central disk. That central disk is, is actually itself a, a product of diffraction. It's a smearing out of the laser beam into a central disk known as something called an airy disk. And airy disks come from these mathematical functions called, I believe they're called Bessel functions. Bessel functions are like, oh my gosh, do we really want it here? But let me just, I mean, I do want to get into it, I guess. That's why I'm talking to you about it. But there's a reason why I'm taking a moment to tell you about Bessel functions. Um, this is a, I just want to find a 2D plot of a, of a Bessel function so I can really freak you guys out here for a second. This is, this is a nice picture to freak you the hell out. Let's scare you like you were in some advanced math class. Um, when people look at a, at a little picture of a star, they tend to think that when they see this central disk of the star, that they're actually looking at the sphere that is the star. Like when we look at our sun or our moon, we can actually see the top of the sun as distinct from the bottom of the sun. Not so with other stars. When we see images of other stars, their light is actually undergoing a type of diffraction that smears the central point source out into something called the airy disk. Meaning if I show you a picture of Alberio here, A and B, you might be thinking that you're actually looking at the spherical star itself, but that's an illusion of diffraction. That's actually the disk of the starlight being smeared over the false disk called the airy disk. So in a way, Tina, your question is correct. The, the glare of the star, the size of that airy disk will grow with the exposure time of your camera, right? Like um, if I show you a picture of, I don't know, stars. Uh, uh, shoot, field of stars. Or if we look at a nebula, sometimes you can see images in astronomy where one of the stars is much more luminous the, than the other ones and will just completely blow out the other stars. Like almost, but not quite here. Here's a field of stars. I'm just kind of grabbing these pictures up at random. Uh, but you can see that, oh, you can actually see the diffraction patterns around these stars. Can you guys see those little circular rings around the stars? You're actually able to see the diffraction patterns here. So in a way, Tina, the answer to your question, may forgive me for being long-winded, but the answer to your question is yes. Because as you image the star, its central airy disk is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's going to overexpose and block out the light from the fainter planets. Okay. 
Capiche? Okay, cool. Uh, let's do our last problem. Uh, I, did, I didn't get to copy down because I wasn't able to see. Oh, I'm sorry. I went on a, a ripper there. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm on like the last sentence anyway. All right, sure. Take your time. All right, you can get rid of it. All right, here we go. Jace, can I trouble you, you one last time for a reading of our last problem? I guess. All right, what's the number? 54. Hold on, let me get my black marker. Uh, here we go. All right, chapter 654. This is a quick one. The title? The Size of Radio Telescopes. OK. Read it out. What is the diffraction limit of a 100 meter radio telescope observing radio waves with a wavelength of 21 centimeters? Compare this to the diffraction limit of Hubble Space Telescope for visible light. Use your results to explain why, to be useful, radio telescopes must be larger than optical telescopes. Let's draw a little crappy cartoon of a radio telescope. I'm going to put some support structure down here, and then I'm going to have a big radio dish, usually have some big metal dish, and then they have a, uh, an antenna called a feed horn antenna, which attaches to your radio telescope. So the way this works is the really long wavelength radio waves come in, and they bounce off your parabolic dish, and they, they bounce down into the feed horn where it's collected uh, by the detector and transmitted to the astronomers in the control station below. Radio telescopes are pretty cool. They operate at super long wavelengths, 21 centimeters. And 100 meters represents the diameter of this dish from edge to edge. They're suggesting that we go ahead and we calculate the diffraction limit of a radio telescope. From our lecture today, the diffraction limit is alpha minimum is 250,000 arc seconds times wavelength divided by diameter. Wavelength and diameter need to have the same units. So let's quickly convert our wavelength into meters. Wavelength is 21 centimeters. Students, what's the conversion from centimeters to meters? One hundred centimeters is one meter. Which means we move the decimal place back twice, giving us 0 0.21 meters for the wavelength. We can now compute the diffraction limit. Alpha min is 250 arc seconds times 0 0.21 meters over 100 meters. Go ahead and punch that up for me. Five hundred and twenty five arc seconds. Yeah, or let's just call it five hundred and thirty arc seconds. Because precision and all that. Now students, you're supposed to know some stuff about angles. How many arc minutes is that? What's the conversion? Arc minutes to arc seconds. Eight, eight <coughs> arc minutes? Eight or nine arc minutes, right? I think it comes out to be eight. Nine. Point eight. eight or yeah. nine, yeah. That's about nine arc minutes. How many degrees is that, Jace, since you and I are talking? I forget about Not the degrees. many. No. Let's leave it as arc minutes. I got a better question for you. What is the angular size of the moon in arc minutes? 
30 arc minutes? That's right. It's a half a degree, right? So, Jace, assuming that nine is kind of like 10 arc minutes, if I took a picture of the moon with that radio telescope, what would it look like? About a third. Yet the beam size of your telescope is like a third of this moon. And that means each pixel, if you took a picture of the moon with a radio telescope, this is what it would look like. It would be three pixels tall and two pixels wide. That's what the moon would look like if you took a picture of it with a radio telescope. In other words, radio telescopes are really, really sucky and they have really sucky angular resolution. The moon would only be three pixels across. What the hell? Why would anyone want a telescope like that? Well, let's think about the other parts of this question. What are they, they asked us to compare it to Hubble, right? Yeah. So let's compare to Hubble. Uh, Hubble is, so it's 530 arc seconds divided by Hubble, which is 0.05 arc seconds. Give me a two sig fig answer there. Gosh. Pardon? 1100? Or 11,000. Which is it? Yeah, sorry, 1,000. Okay. Jeez. What is the meaning of 11,000, Kayla? Arc seconds. No, arc seconds cancel. Uh, 11,000 times. Times what? Um, 11,000 times what? What's the meaning of the 11,000? The resolution is less. Worse than Hubble, right? What's the last part of the question, Jace? Give me a sec. Use your results to explain why, to be useful, radio telescopes must be much larger than optical telescopes. Okay. Anyone think they can take a whack at that one or? Do you wanna just wait for me to put it on the spoon and right into your mouth? Why do I have to make radio telescopes big? To capture radio waves? Not exactly. You know, you can you ever see one of those like little satellite TV dishes on your on your 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 uncle's or your grandpappy's house? They're they're effective radio telescopes and they're like a quarter of a meter big. Uh uh satellite TV dish. Right? You know what I'm what are those things called? Yeah, let me show you, uh, am, I, am I on share screen right now? Share screen. Let me show you one of these puppies right here. You see these? These are radio telescopes. They don't have to be so big to capture radio waves. That's too simplistic an answer for me. That thing is probably 30, 40 centimeters across. Why are they making this radio telescope 100 meters? Let me show you some example. Let me, wait a minute. I'm not done with share screen yet. Let me show you some examples. The Arecibo radio telescope is so big that it's carved into a mountain valley. 
This actually appeared in a James Bond movie. I think they blew it up, of course. And this, this radio telescope, which is no longer the world's largest radio telescope, is so big you can't even really steer this thing. You have to wait for Earth to rotate into the direction of the object that you want to look at. Today, the new hotness in radio telescope uh, science is actually operated by the Chinese. It's called the Fast Radio Telescope. And it's carved into a karst, a mountain de uh, valley depression. And it just completed its, its, uh, its launch here. It, they basically sort of just did their first light for the telescope or something. They, they just completed the construction of it in any case. This thing is 500 meters in diameter. It's the world's biggest radio telescope. That's an entire mountain valley. Look, those are roads down there. See that? Those are, little, those are roads. This thing is humongous. Why are people trying to make such gargantuan radio telescopes? It's not just that the radio waves are longer, it's got something to do with this formula. Is it to capture the, the smallest, the faint radio waves from, I don't know, from the cosmos? <laughs> it's, it's not just about faintness, it's also about angular resolution. Uh, Tina, how does the diameter affect your angular resolution? If we look at the math of this formula here, where's my damn pointer stick? I lost it. It's not important. How does, what does the diameter factor into your angular resolution, Tina? Did I lose you there? Um. I'm not sure. Well, look, there's the diameter of your dish. There's your minimum angle. What does it mean that this thing is on the bottom of the denominator or the bottom of the equation there? It's going to be divided. Yeah. What happens when you divide by a big number? What happens to your quotient? Smaller. So is that good or bad? It's good. So explain what the hell I'm talking about then. <laughs> no, I'm just going to confuse everyone. <laughs> Look, what you're, I'm getting confused just talking to myself here. <laughs> Does anyone understand what the hell I'm trying to say? Is it the bigger the diameter, the smaller the... The re resolution? Yes! Yes, that's right. They are inversely proportional. If you're stuck operating at really long ass wavelengths, you are going to have a big and sucky ass angular resolution. I can compensate by maximizing the diameter of my telescope, which attempts to minimize this angle and improve the resolution of my telescope. Let's put that into a little sentence together, okay? Radio telescopes need to be large because they operate at longer wavelengths and thus, um, what's the word I want to use? Crappier, okay, let's not say crappier, that's not professional, and thus larger angular resolutions, which is clearly worse, right? So we can say by increasing the telescope diameter, we can reduce the minimum angle 
of resolution and improve the image. Okay, we did it. That took a little while. I didn't I think it was gonna take that long, but. Can I go back to gallery mode? How's our copying doing? You can't feel my legs. Oh my God, Angel, I'm so sorry. Dude, in the future when we're cyborgs, I'll just download this all from my brain to your brain by USB cable, but we're not there yet. So currently it takes time for information to be transmitted from professor to student. All right, are we happy? Or at least are we satisfied that we're done? Uh, I'll try to get these lectures and homeworks up right away. Uh, any last questions or comments that I should be aware of? Yes, Jace. Uh, please save this chat log. <laughs> oh, is it really funny? I've got to save this chat log. I know I wanna read it so bad. I can't feel my legs, that's it. All right, so file. Save chat done. <laughs> you should feed the you should feed the raccoon because there's probably less scraps getting dropped on the streets now because there's less people. Yeah. Uh, he well, that, trust, trust me, you'd think that raccoon is getting more handouts than anybody in this town. But just so that you won't think I've I've been neglecting the little bugger here. Um, if I share screen iPhone, I can share my sound. I don't know if anybody else saw, but since since people were um, were panic buying, like they were buying a ton of food, like way more than they needed to because they were overreacting because, you know, people are, are stupid and, you know, unintelligent. But uh, they were overreacting and buying a bunch of food. And then there was pictures on the Internet of like garbage cans full of like fresh food. Like people were throwing away the food because they bought too much. That's heaven for not only raccoons, but also other people that live by scavenging, which is a whole yeah, that, thing. And that's, that's good for them, but everybody was really angry because they were like, you, you bought the food that other people could have used, and there, there's people who don't have food, and you just bought it and then just threw it away, and that's really wasteful. And I, I kind of agreed with it. I mean, but the raccoon will have a fun time. So Here, let's check out. Let's see how he's doing here. He's going to feed off of mankind's mistakes. <laughs> Is it playing? Oh wow, it's really glitchy. There he is. I gave him a cookie. Huh. Oh, that was the other one. Where's the other one here? Oh, there he is. There he is. Psst, psst. Buddy. You want a cookie or what? Come get your cookie. Come get your cookie. Yeah. <laughs> Who's got the cookie? <laughs> Who's got the cookie? <laughs> Gotta love a raccoon. <laughs> Gotta love a raccoon. What kind of cookie was it? I was a peanut butter cookie. Actually, one of the tutors, you know Will, one of our tutors on Monday? Yeah. Will made them and I had a little Christmas party and I forgot about them. I didn't eat them all. So they got really, really stale. So indirectly, that's, it's funny that you should mention that because our tutor, Will, he made those cookies. And I have yet to tell him that I've been feeding the raccoon his peanut butter cookies, but at some point I'm gonna have to spill the beans. <laughs> But All right. it's funny how he just like reaches for it. Like he's not really scared to, like he just reaches for it. Oh himself. yeah, that, their little paws are adorable. 
Hey, did anyone else have a question? I thought I saw Lucas's hand go up, but I think we lost him. All right, I'm going to stop the recording over now.